Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry I can't be there. It looks like a great uh, confab, a lot of smart people, and a really important topic. I'll get right to it. Our work is uh, is using largely Lancet, but now we're incorporating Sentinel 2 and Planet and a lot of um, developmental kind of approaches. But Landsat is the time machine we have right now for deeper history. Problem with Landsat is that it, it is not an operational system. Uh, one of my last points is that we need to get into the mode of operational land mo monitoring as we have with weather. Uh, NOAA in the United States has uh, backups for all for all their major systems so that we never are, are missing any any data. And there's also a continuity of observation uh, quality and scale. Landsat is not like that at all. Each one is a one off and has different characteristics. If you look at the archive, this uh, our first product globally was based on 2000 2012 data. It's roughly half of what we get thereafter with when Landsat 8 comes on and Landsat 7's um, acquisition rate is increased. So we can go from 1999, Landsat 7 is getting an average of four acquisitions per year, seasonal acquisitions. Landsat 5 is supplementing it. Our worst data record is 2012. When Landsat 5 is decommissioned in 2011 and, and Landsat 8 has yet to come online. So the issue around, it's, it's really not an algorithmic issue. The issue is data richness and data quality. The signal noise of Landsat 8 is 14, 15 times greater than Landsat 7 because it's a push broom. So you can't blame space agencies for improving you know, their, their, their data. But uh, if you want to do long term monitoring, you're challenged using uh, data of inconsistent uh, quality and quantity. Regardless, we move ahead and I'll come back to that, that issue a little bit. We move ahead and we have time series. Uh, we we were part of the MODIS science team and, and, and uh, got into this time series uh, mode. And then we when the, we started practicing with Landsat, when Landsat archive opened up in 2008, we started doing per pixel processing to clear, clean up the data and correct it radiometrically so to, to do QA and remove clouds and shadows and haze to prioritize binning of composites um, to do anisotropic corrections on BRDF, especially at low latitudes such as rainforests, and then to uh, populate um, the typical MODIS time series uh, composite periods, so 16 day monthly and the like, and we deliver uh, free on, on online uh, a 16 day Landsat data time series. And this is really nice because it's meant to normalize your feature space. I know there's a lot of uh, newer uh, algorithms that use every pixel and, and fit harmonics and like, and that's super cool too. Um, but we like to try and create you know, nominally cloud free uh, time series over fit composite periods. And then once you have that, you can put these 16 day in the case of Landsat time series uh, to work to estimate dynamics, um, such as we see here, which is we see some two fires in the top and then we see regrowth in the bottom right. We see something stable in the lower left for some boreal forest example. So again, you start off with uh, with uh, basically uncalibrated data and we go from that to some some form of time series cloud free imagery. And with the, the cloud free uh, time series, we can develop time series metrics and map things such as forest and the dynamics around forests. This is the, the first global product we made. And you know, it's a, it's a, and, and the whole idea is to monitor and say what's happening in trends. And so we can look at the trends and the big, the big signal in this one. First, the, first of all, the globe, the northern boreal is pretty noisy as interannual variability is very high there, but still trending. Uh, up in the literature, but the Brazilian interaction with uh, with the program um, to slow deforestation, you see yellow colors that still still highlight very strongly in the arc deforestation. Uh, now coming back to those levels of which approached, I think almost almost 30,000 square kilometers in 2004. But that that's one of the clearest signals of policy intervention in the satellite record. And as as Gilberto mentioned, uh, the protos data sets the backbone of both quantifying the the challenge and also demonstrating the success of policy and now also the the, the relaxed uh, you know the failure of the of uh, the government to sustain that that initiative so our general approach is to do active learning where we focus a lot on training data we focus a lot on um, uh, our feature space the feature spaces are built per 
per theme, we can have hundreds or a thousand features going at a at a at a uh, at a dynamic, but we think through them as kind of a creative process. We also uh, and then we apply a machine learning algorithm. We have the decision tree uh, is our back backbone. We we are working. I'll, I'll show some examples of deep learning where, where you, you you have justified reasons for looking at context, spatial context, and there's plenty of that. Um, and then we just iterate. So we we rely on geographers who know how to use advanced computational methods and statistical methods, uh, but geographers kind of know how to steer and drive map making exercises. The uh, thing that's become half of our work, well, equal to our mapping work, is the sample based estimates for our different land cover, land use, extent and change products. Basic point is that samples, uh, unbiased statistical estimators are needed to report areas. Um, every, everybody historically has taken probability based samples and used that to map accuracies. That's a secondary interest of ours. No map is unbiased. Maps are either overestimate or underestimate whatever theme it is. Sometimes they're perfect, uh, <laughs> I, I imagine. Um, but you certainly would love your map to be within a certain, let's say, standard air of range of your sample based area. But you do not. In you know, make decisions or, or count pixels uh, as 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 being a definitive uh, finding. So it, as much area as much effort as we put in maps, we put in a sec improving our sample based area estimates, and then we can take that area estimate and refine the map, make the map at least unbiased, not perfect. It will have an overall accuracy that, that will still be, you know, could be low, could be high, but you can certainly make using a uh, fuzzy methods, a, a map that matches your area. estimate. And that's good for we work with a lot of uh, countries in the tropics on uh, monitoring and, and having a map that matches the area estimates very nice. Our approach is to map things individually. Uh, we don't put um, three, four, five, ten themes into one algorithm, and we have a hierarchy where we start with cover and then we get into use as we go down. And as you go from top to bottom in this graphic, you really are looking at easier to map at the top, harder to map at the bottom. Um, and a lot of times we'll map something at the top and use samples to estimate themes at the bottom in blue, the land use related themes. And also as you go from the top to the bottom per pixel to to uh, deep learning, it can be argued as a general a general uh, shift because you're going to have a hard time, uh, let's say doing pasture per pixel just based on phenology and the like pasture you'll you might have to use range lines and uh, and watering holes and that sort of stuff. Well, it's the, that's that's the hardest one on this on this slide. And then we also have different issues about drivers on the lower left. You see different act factors of change that you, you can map independently uh, of, of the of the land cover land use. So to show this idea, we, we produce surface water dynamics every uh, month for for the globe and and we have a product um, where and this is simple similar to the JRC product where you're just mapping in a QA. Our QA is built into each observation. If it comes out as water, we can build up vectors and of water uh, dynamics and show that you know they're impoundments for for agriculture and, and cities, which are the blue colors around the edge of the of Lake Ermia. Uh, as well as climate effects are starving the lake of water. That's an interannual dynamic. We have interannual dynamics. This is the annual flood of the Zamb upper Barazzi Zambezi floodplain that comes like clockwork, and you can tr track those dynamics. The white color in the middle of the floodplain is the ever, you know, always filled main channel of the Zambezi. And so we can characterize, uh, classify the dynamics into different types of, of dynamics, stable water, uh, loss of water, et cetera, and then build a stratification. And then we throw samples and we interrogate each of those samples per uh, agnostic to the strata they come from per the rule set and say whether or not there was a dynamic of surface water change. Our answer comes from this. Algorithms are very hard to extrapolate regionally, globally. Um, you're going to have biases, as I said, but as a stratifier, as a targeting mechanism, they're very good. The areas come from these samples. So when we talk about the JRC study of, of Scandinavia, you don't lead with accuracy. Your first result in your abstract is the area estimation from samples, not, not pixel counts. So an area of water, this is a weird slide, sorry, but you have in, it's inland water area about, uh, I can't remember, something like 5% of it is surface water. That's the, the colors on the far right. 
of the pixels that have had water, uh, we get about 40% is dynamic, and and most of that is coming and going. So it's a it's a very tough and well, it's just super dynamic land cover or whatever you want to call it, literally a land cover. Um, and then the permanent gain is much larger than permanent loss, larger than due to reservoir building. So cool. So that's that's our that is I gave that as a, as a as an example where we've mapped a theme. It's surface water. We 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 validate that theme. We have accuracy numbers fine. But that surface water map can be used to build strata of ca categories of interest, and then we can interpret those with reference data and report uh, what the dynamic is using an unbiased estimator and having uncertainties around that. So then we have, uh, you know, our our our, um, our flagship product is this global forest uh, loss product, which is running now for 20 20 years. If you look at the Landsat record and and how we did the first one on 12 years and then from there on individual year updates, um, it, it has changed a little bit, but the algorithm still the decision tree. Um, there is some refinement, but the biggest thing again that we should think about is data quality, data richness, which are going to impact your your product. And even even if you had the perfect time series, and, and you can you can imagine something like Modus, where you have the same observational density. Every frequency every year, even fixed algorithms that run on that are, are are biased in particular, you know, they're just they're not perfect maps. So uh, a lot of our key interests with uh, with global forest watch are humid tropical forest. Um, I'm just going to show the pixel counts from this uh, because it, it reminded me of uh, it wanted to be reminded of what something Gilberto said about uh, Protus. We we agree with Protus if it's not a bad fire year. Protus is doing is is really focused on deforestation, not degradation. And and as as uh, he mentioned, we we map tree cover loss. But if we put down our primary forest mask, and that's the same approach that Protus uses, they have a primary forest mask, and then they they erode that annually. So you have this asset that just shrinks. It's a fantastic way to track uh, a finite resource, the key resource related to land use and emissions, the key resource related to terrestrial biodiversity. So this is a this is from um, we have a few papers. One of them is a is a paper on primary forest extent, and we do the same thing. Just erode it. This is the these are the pixel counts inside of there. And 2016 is a huge fire year, and it causes great variance with produce. Um, but we, we have a new product uh, uh, just released uh, that that is I, I don't know if it's up on Global Forest Watch yet, where we're attributing the pixels that are are identified as, as disturbed due to fire. And this will be a, a further harmonization, a better better way to harmonize for those big fire years with Protus, because our, our 2014 map on primary forest loss strongly, largely agreed with Protus, even though you know we have minimum map union and its difference and methodological differences, but I think, uh, cool. I will say, <clears throat> going back to data issues, Protus is really a flagship product because it has not changed. The initial method relied on single date imagery in the dry season along the arc of deforestation. That's basically the method now. It has large minimum mapping unit, which creates a, 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 sort, of, a sort of a facility. And so you have this method, even vis-a-vis -vis the data inputs being consistent. That's a very trustworthy product because yeah, uh, even if they got a lot more data, it's the method doesn't really require it. So and to Dalton's credit, Dalton Valeriano has resisted <laughs> all, all, uh, all, I think, uh, all, all like pushback to, to advance the method because the method works. Um, so we have a uh, global forest change. This is an, a, a diversion, but we're, we're mapping, we're, we're mapping height with forest now. And so we get this thing where we have our, our product, which maps change disturbance directly versus change inferred from time series of height. This is really hard because uh, to map a forest, you need a time series. And to map change, you might just need one or two observations. And these things, uh, you can be much more sensitive attacking change as your, as your var variable of interest, your theme, versus time series of height, which will smooth over a lot of ephemeral dynamics. Anyway, but the, the advantage of the height is that we can say something about tall forest being cleared versus short forest. That's the red versus the pink, and we we get a better a better calibration on gain, which is the blue, or you know Uruguay is the the country with the greatest 
increase in tree cover due to largely eucalypt plantations. On the tree cover side, we're working a whole bunch of uh, approaches to validate it at global scale, both per pixel kind of deep hist histories, and then also with uh, planet data to see if um, you know we can get a better idea of our commission errors related to to patch size and that sort of thing. That's fine. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about same idea. It's going to be a broken record, but it's looking at uh, cropland extent. Uh, you know, an outgrowth of our work has been to look at land use as a driver of deforestation, as a as an as a land use that appro you know appropriates natural land cover. And so this pro pro paper, and I want to mention Peter Potapoff, who is leading a number of these initiatives. This is a paper, Nature Food, by Peter. Um, and we have we have, yeah, we have a great team. Uh, Amy Pickens does the water. I, I usually have the, the the references here on the slides. Um, we've got about uh, 102 million hectares increase of cropland, the largest expansion in Africa by area, the largest proportional expansion in South America. Um, half of this expansion comes from natural vegetation. Those numbers, all of those numbers in this paragraph at the bottom, they're not pixel counts. They're sample based estimates interpreted, and we are not mapping natural vegetation here. We're getting that from the from the samples. So I'm going to beat that drum. I haven't I'm really heard. I haven't been in the meeting uh, the entire time. Sorry, but uh, but this is <laughs> it's critical in your abstract. You lead with this. You don't lead with pixel counts and you don't say anything about the relative trend in pixel counts. And so we've got all these dynamics and we can say how much is due to different different uh, drivers where where those uh, where those changes occurred. And so you see in places like China losing uh, cropland to to, uh, to urbanization. Um, you see uh, losing some cropland to abandonment in, in the former in Russia, but most of its gain, most of its expansion. Now we go down the hierarchy. Now we're into cropland. We're going to go to crop type. Crop type is a further challenge. It's a very hard algorithm to, to scale globally. It is by definition going to be applied regionally because it is tied to local phenologies. It's hard to make a generic uh, uh, feature space for soy at the global scale or corn, but it's also a, a timeliness thing. You need to get these data out. This is this is meant to be uh, something where you get information as early as possible. This is a fun one because you cannot validate crop type at the desktop. Uh, a lot of the themes I talked about before, you can. And so we stratify, we make a, a map of, of soybean in this case, and we stratify uh, uh, South America into high, medium, low indicated soy. And then we draw a sample, and then we go to those uh, blocks. We use 20 kilometer blocks. Each block has a secondary sample of 20 pixels, and we go visit them and say something about the condition, et cetera of the crop type. We've done this uh, um, for for all of the Americas and China, and that's about, I don't know, 96% of production. Uh, in the end, we take, uh, we, we map these blocks as well, and this is where we bring in Sentinel-2 data with Lancet. Sentinel-2 really drives a lot of this. We're very enamored of Sentinel-2 data on the crop monitoring, as most people are, and we map the, the, the crop type of interest. In this case, it's, it's soybean. And then we have the stratification and we, we have these maps of each sample. And these are the maps, the maps for Brazil, but these are the basis of our estimate. And it shows you that the high stratum is indicated by a strat by our stratification, which is Landsat based is really good. The stratification works. We have very low variance across our strata. So we have a sampling efficiency and we we've, we've, we've estimated since 2017 going from about 31 million hectares of soybean up to 41 million hectares of soybean in, in five years. Uh, surpassing the U.S. by a long shot in that in that time. We've just added corn. Corn we estimated this year to be 21 million hectares. If you add those together, you're up around 62 million hectares of soy and corn, and the U.S. is at 72. So, so Brazil's coming. Um, and we, and the, the thing about it is, we use the same method in both regions, uh, and we get very precise estimates. And then we can make maps, and we can backcast those maps and compare them to official data, and et cetera, et cetera. So, that's pretty neat um and we're used we're moving on to other things i think i'm gonna run out of time so i'm gonna skip this um how much time do i have i don't know when i started you've got about, about five minutes five left minutes. in order to leave sure. about 
to 10 minutes for questions. Sure. OK, so so uh, I'm skipping some planted examples of, of, of crop type mapping. This is uh, an example of vegetation fraction mapping. Same idea where we track trends in vegetation cover and all these blues represent loss of vegetation. We're doing we're making a global um, in, in collaboration NASA JPL, a global disturbance alert system with this idea. But you basically track where vegetation is being lost. It's small, you know, either ephemerally or or permanently. And you see all of these different dynamics. In this picture of the US, we see fracking landscapes, we see mountaintop removal mining landscapes, we see urban sprawl. And again, we do the sample based assessment to get our areas of actual change for this variable. But in these samples, we attribute the dynamics and we can say something about how many, how much of this, how much of the area globally is due to uh, resource extraction like mining, how much of it is due to infrastructure building like roads and ports, how much of it is due to commercial residential expansion. And you see the engine that is China. China accounts for 35% of this. The US and China together kind of for half. This is an old study. But it's again, this the, the, the thing I like to show about this study is that this is a needle in the haystack from area estimate. You'll never map it really well, but you will be able to target it. And by targeting it, you can do these samples and get very precise estimates on what's happening. And then in those estimates, you can add value. You can you can you could assign different attributes. And all these countries like Canada, Russia, Australia are dominated by resource extraction, feeding the engine that is China. Um, almost done. Uh, built up areas. Another one. I, I like this. Uh, this is kind of fun. It's a hard one because this is a deep learning example. We're like this is Landsat built up area. The same training data. This is this is for Naples, uh, Italy. This is Sentinel two at ten meter. And this is planet at three meters. And I'll zoom into this area. When they get the contextual, you know, window moving, you're going to get blurring. It's it's inevitable uh, unless you are really the spatial resolutions below the object size. So we see very different depictions. And this is obviously very compelling uh, uh, with with planet. So it's it's a it's an interesting theme. I, I used to think like mapping forest loss in the Congo is hard because of all the fragmentation and moth eaten edges. But what the heck is built up area versus structure structure extent versus uh, impervious surface? I think this is a fun one. So in the end, we are working at integrating these these products at the global scale. I, I could show. Um, you know, some this this idea that uh, with the with some support from the Bezos Earth Fund, we're putting multiple themes together and tracking land use change. So this is a 2000 image for Mato Grosso. This is 2020 and you see all the dynamics and then you can actually highlight dynamics in their own color. So yellow being cropland expansion on non forest, red being cropland expansion on forest. Do the same thing over in uh, the northern China plain and look at the loss of agricultural land where we have 2000 oranges crops and then the urbanization of, of the region. And you can see all this huge ex expansion of the industrial footprint and the and the and the, and the urban footprint. OK, um, I just want to get to some quick comments. So no map is unbiased. Area estimates are derived from probability samples of reference data. That should be just the gospel. Um, the map is a targeting mechanism. It's very good as an indicator. Uh, to to efficiently allocate samples for for your theme of interest and and uh, and even if it's if it's not perfect, um, given given uh, uh, a documented accuracy and relative performance, especially across time, it can be support decision making for sure, and it can support science efforts that need spatial explicit inputs for modeling. Um, algorithms need, need to suit this theme of interest. So I, I, you know, everybody jumping on deep learning, regardless of the theme, I think is silly. Some some themes are per pixel. That's that's all there's that's all there is to it. Vegetation fraction, that's a uh, uh, tree height. Um, depending, you, know, you could talk about different scales. Uh, if you're going to do one meter, maybe everything is deep learning. Um, geographic domain experts are really, I think, the folks who should drive this. I, I think we have a lot of folks that are, you know. More on the computational side, but um, I think the act of learning is necessary in in our work. So you need to, to iterate and improve, um, and so on and so forth. A globally consistent land cover land use change can be used off the shelf to for people to you do area estimation uh, studies for sure. Um, 
And then I just want to reiterate that Earth Observation System should be operational moving, you know, some at some point operational, have a core capability so that we can have Earth System data records that are directly comparable and direct products that are directly comparable at the map scale. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in in the Slido channel, so I want to take um, probably five to ten minutes. Everyone, please uh, go through and and rate the questions so we can make sure uh, we can at least get to the most popular ones. Uh, it looks like we have one from Patrick. Could you give us an update on which computational infrastructure you are using for this work? Maybe also reflect a bit on the experiences made so far. Right, we we are using our own data intensive high performance computing system. So it's a it's a system built for prim primarily it's high memory nodes, high input output. So we want to bring in and and do calculations and write out data fast. So it's not it's not your typical university uh, CPU optimized uh, core optimized uh, system. Uh, we have a very sharp system architect who's built it. We're up to we're, we're up to 50 petabytes of storage. So I don't know. It's it's weird. We we've we've been lucky enough to build it out and to to uh, grow it. I don't know how sustainable it is, but it, it's our own sandbox, and it makes us we can run global algorithms in, overnight essentially on that. So I I don't and and because we're at a university, you know, we have a primary data center that is a big cost saver for us in terms of energy. So it's very it's it's I mean I don't do I recommend it I I, I reckon I sort of recommend it but um it's it's costly and you have to have really sharp people uh, running it obviously um but yeah we do all of the Google Google Earth we still do some some work on there our, our Sentinel two alerts I think are on there uh, but the, and it's fantastic uh, you know entry point for large area mapping and monitoring but we've been able to do it ourselves. Great, thanks. Um, our next question is from Tom. What is your experience with validating accuracy of land cover change classes? So deforestation rate, loss of wetlands, desertification, what works best? Well, for sure you need a map. Uh, change over most time periods is a distinct minority of a landscape. Um, you could have countries like Indonesia where over 30 years a quarter or more of the forest have been lost and you could throw a random sample and get a good a good estimate because the change class itself is so big. Uh, so there unfortunately there are there are uh, areas like that. But if you're looking at uh, short time intervals in most places, it's a it's a, a a small area. So you have to you have to make a map that targets it. Our biggest challenge with with that is is accounting for false negatives. So if you're looking for a needle in the haystack, a very tiny area, and you throw your samples and you get a false negative sample, in other words, you're looking at deforestation and you have a huge, I don't know. I'm on hold, it's on. We can hear you still, are we good? Unfortunate. Uh, okay, let's give him a sec. It looks like he might have lost. I'm gonna get. Yeah, oh. sorry, that was rough. Anyway, okay, you're back. Can you hear me? I'll, yeah. I'll say it real quickly. You you uh you have to worry about samples of deforestation in huge non-change strata. So it's like you almost have to have a, a stratum that is your your uh, stratum of possible change. But we have some papers on that. Maybe you could look up. Great, thanks. Um, OK, we've got a lot of questions left, so let's see how many we can get through in the next couple minutes. Um, another popular one uh, from Gerchan is Ceccherini 2020 stated European wood harvest rose 69%. We showed it was due to algorithm changes in the GFW product around 2015, but how do you see this? Uh, I, my first comments were on Landsat 8 being a much better instrument and, and acquisition rates, even for Landsat 7, not quite doubling, but going up. So you go from uh, a very poor 
well, I don't say poor. We're, we're happy with the first decade of Landsat 2000, 2010. But once you double it, you get a lot more detectability. The detectability a lot of times centers around um, like degradation dynamics and it probably thinning in the in the case of Europe. And so the question is, are you are you are you adding that or, you know, to the to a to a to a, um, the same algorithm? So the algorithm, of course, changed because it, it changed in the sense that we had to move every year forward, a single year forward. My recollection is that uh, 2015 had the baseline of the 2013-14 good data as a reference, and it 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 is a. But I don't I don't think that's the distinctive year. I think uh, 2013 you'd find different changes in different parts of the world with Landsat 8. I know that in Africa, smallholder became a lot crisper, cleaner with Landsat 8, and where it was fuzzier before before. But I all I'm saying is. If you have those products, you can still throw a probability sample and go into some reference data. Those reference data can be Landsat because the algorithm cannot extrapolate perfectly well. If you look at a pixel in isolation with landscape information, with uh, with uh, a really good image interpreter, possibly supplemented by Google Earth or any other kind of aerial information, um, you can do an assignment of the pixel back to 2000 that says what what its dynamics are. Uh, and and that's that's how you would derive the area and say whether or not it was 69% increase or not. The 69% increase shouldn't come from pixels. It should come from samples. Great. Thank you so much.